Resonance is a very important physical phenomenon. It occurs in many different types of driven oscillatory systems. And the word is, uh, the meaning of the word is you're driving at a frequency that maximizes the response. And that's what we're going to be talking about. <clears throat> to understand this, we consider the uh, standard, this is a standard model of an oscillator. We've got a mass and a spring. A force, an oscillatory force, is exerted on the mass. Um, this F here is the drive amplitude, and omega is the drive frequency. We're going to see in a moment that um, we have to include damping. So there's a damping force here on the mass, and the simplest model of a damping force is that the force is proportional to the velocity and in the opposite direction of the velocity. Um, the natural frequency here is the square root of the stiffness divided by the inertia, the square root of k over m. Now I need to add something here. This is the, the standard model, but in the demonstrations you're going to be seeing, uh, and in mechanical systems in general, mechanical oscillatory systems in general, it's much easier to drive the boundary rather than it is to drive the mass. The results are similar. They're not the same, but they are similar. So we're going to be dealing with boundary-driven oscillations. But this is our model here. Um, so if you want to maximize the response, which frequency should you drive with? Oh, it's important to see, to realize, that this omega can be anything from zero to infinity, the drive frequency. This omega, omega naught here, is the, as a parameter of the system. It's fixed. <clears throat> so if you want to maximize the response, what frequency should you drive with? Well, not surprisingly, it's the natural frequency, which is the frequency without damping and without drive. And um, there's a little bit of a problem here. <clears throat> You can show that when you drive at the natural frequency, what is maximized is the velocity amplitude of the oscillator. So if you change the frequency, keeping the force amplitude constant, you get a maximum amplitude of the velocity when omega is equal to omega naught. Surprisingly, the maximum displacement amplitude does not occur precisely at omega naught. Um, however, in typical cases of weak to moderate damping, it's a very good approximation that the maximum displacement amplitude will occur at omega is equal to omega naught. And we will make that assumption. And the reason I'm mentioning this, the reason it's important, is that in these demonstrations, what you naturally see is displacement, not velocity. It's much easier to see displacement. So we're going to be dealing with displacement. Uh, OK, so the next thing would be write down Newton's second law for our model system here. The sum of the forces equals the mass times the acceleration, and solve it. <clears throat> Usually, we don't need a general solution. Um, usually what's important is what's called the steady state motion. When you have an oscillator and you switch on a drive, there'll be, a, in the beginning, there'll be a usually complicated motion due to the fact that there are transients in the system. They eventually die out, and you're left with a constant amplitude, displacement amplitude, going at the frequency of the drive. So in the steady state displacement, after the transients die away, the frequency of the response is the same as the frequency of the drive. There's a constant amplitude. And we have to include the fact that there's a phase difference between the response and the drive. Remember, the drive is a cosine. We're choosing a cosine drive here. And because theta is positive, which you can see here, um, the displacement lags the force by this angle theta because of that minus sign. So if, if you think of this as the force, oscillatory force, the response is lagging behind. This is the response, OK? Um, let's see, one more thing. This maximum amplitude here, if you did not have damping in the model, this would be infinite. So this is why we have to include damping. We have to be more realistic here. Otherwise, we get an infinite maximum amplitude. OK, to understand these sketches here, we're going to look at demonstrations. So the first one 
is a torsional oscillator. So this is a, we have a, a wheel here, an inertial wheel, okay? And you're, what you're seeing now are torsional oscillations. There's a spiral spring, and one, of it is, one end of it is attached to the wheel here. And you can see that the damping here is pretty weak, okay? That's a problem. The weaker the damping, the longer you have to wait to get to the steady state motion. So the manufacturers of this have taken this into account. What they have here, behind this support, you can't see it because of the support, but behind the support are, um, is an electromagnet. And this metal wheel passes between the poles of the electromagnet. When you have a conductor moving in a magnetic field, there is a damping effect. It's called magnetic braking. Um, so we can control that. The more current we put in the electromagnet, the greater the magnetic field, the greater the magnetic braking. Okay? Um, and that's important because otherwise we'd be here a long time waiting for this thing to reach a steady state motion. Uh, now, the drive. You'll notice here there's a white arrow representing the response, the displacement, the angular displacement. Uh, this black arrow here represents the drive. There's a rod here connected off center to a motor. So this motor is going to move at a frequency that I can control, and it drives the attached end of the spring here back and forth. So what's happening is we have this kind of a situation. This is a, the bound, a boundary-driven case. Um, okay, so I have it set up now on resonance. So we're going to be driving at very close to the natural frequency. I'm going to switch it on. And of course, the oscillator doesn't immediately go into its steady state. There's transient motion. In this case, driving at the resonant frequency, the transient motion is quite simple. The oscillations just build up in amplitude at the same frequency of the drive as the drive, which is the natural frequency here. And now if you look at this, it's, it's almost reached, its, at this point, it's pretty much reached its steady state. All right, so this is resonance. What you see here is a big amplitude. Well, um, wait a minute, what do I mean by big? Well, we can compare it to the drive. See the black arrow there? It's going back and forth a distance like this and at an angle. And the response is much bigger. So this is, we're on resonance. We have a big amplitude of the response. But just as important is the phase. What is the phase? Can you see this? It's not in phase. It's not 180 degrees out of phase. It's in between. And if you stare at it long enough, you can convince yourself that it's actually 90 degrees. We're right here right now. And the displacement is lagging the force by 90 degrees. Um, so this is called the, um, res when you're driving in this region of frequency right here, it's called the resonance regime. It's also called the dissipation controlled regime because dissipation is controlling what that amplitude is. If you zero out the damping again, it goes to infinity. All right, so now I'm gonna abruptly change the frequency to a, um, much lower value. And you'll see that it's going back and forth more slowly now. Whoops. Okay. Now you can see the motion, is, look at this, the, the motion is complicated. That's because there's two frequencies in the motion here. There's the natural frequency, and then there's the drive frequency. And once the system is responding with two frequencies, it looks complicated. But the motion at the natural frequency dies out due to damping. And now it has died out, and look what we have. We've got steady state motion. It's small amplitude, right? We're over here. We've got small amplitude. And 
What about the phase? Well, it's clear as a bell here. They're, um, they're in phase. The drive and the displacement are in phase. This is called the quasi-static regime. It's, a, it's a essentially static system. We're just very slowly, relatively slowly, changing the force. And the oscillator is tracking that. It's in phase with it. It's also called the um, stiffness cont controlled regime because it's the uh, Hooke's law, it's the stiffness that's playing the role here, controlling the motion. Okay, there's one more regime. This is up here at higher frequency. So let me now go well above resonance. All right, and let me kick this just to give you an idea of where we can see the transients dying away here. You can see the amplitude goes down, then it goes up and down. It's, it's those two frequencies in the motion here. But the response at the natural frequency is dying out. And what we're going to be left with is the steady state motion. Up here, small amplitude, again. Okay, And the phase now, this is called the inertia controlled regime, because what's controlling the motion is the inertia, the inertia of the wheel. Now they're, it's nearly 180 degrees out of phase. The drive and the response are 180 degrees out of phase. OK. Now this is, um, this is an excellent apparatus. There's a, a lot of features to this. You can control it a lot. We use it for many different demonstrations. But the downside is it's very expensive, right? At the other extreme, Let's consider this pointer here as a pendulum, OK? Here's a pendulum. These are damped oscillations, right? And now I'm going to drive at resonance. And you see we get a big response. It's hard to see. You know, this is much better apparatus. But there's a 90 degree phase lag here. And the response is big. It's large compared to the distance I'm moving my my fingers back and forth. So this is on resonance. Here's the quasi-static regime, just Hooke's law, basically. Low frequency. And high frequency is the inertia-controlled regime, where it's 180 degrees out of phase, again with a small amplitude. OK. To motivate the last demonstration, um, I need to tell you that this situation here um, is very common experimentally and even conceptually. We often think of sweeping the frequency, slowly changing the drive frequency from zero to some relatively large value here, while keeping the amplitude constant. Again, this is often done in laboratories. And it's also the way we, we naturally think about um, driven, damped, oscillations. But there's another perspective that's educationally very useful. And this is due to Barton in um, 1918. And it's, naturally, it's natural to do it with pendulums. And here is our Barton's pendulum apparatus here. It consists of these seven light pendulums. These are ping pong balls and flexible plastic strips. Seven of them, all of, uh, you can see the length is increasing here. So the natural frequency is going down as you, as you go this way. Uh, the, the idea here is that here we're sweeping frequency. Here, in a sense, we're sweeping the oscillator. We're considering an array of oscillators. The drive is going to be fixed here. The amplitude of the drive and the frequency of the drive is fixed. It's due to this big, pen, this heavy pendulum here. These pendulums, I need to say something, these pendulums are, to a good approximation, uncoupled. They don't influence each other. And they don't influence this mass. This is a very heavy mass here. Um, this is the third generation apparatus. We had a lot of trouble with this, OK? The main problem was that the transients would last 
just too long. You have to wait too long. And that's a disaster when you're doing lecture demonstrations. So this is why we went to uh, ping pong balls. The lighter the mass, the greater the effect the damping is going to have. We have these wide strips for aerodry aerodynamic drag. Uh, that helps um, reduce the uh, transient time. This was a summer project of a high school student. Okay, so let me do the demo now. I'm going to build up the oscillations here of the heavy mass. Oh, and incidentally, this is another boundary-driven case, as we saw over there, right? We're driving the boundary here. Okay, I think it's in, it looks like it's in a steady state now. What's happening? Well, the greatest amplitude is the middle pendulum, and that's because its length is about the same as the length of the driving pendulum. That's the resonant. That pendulum is resonating, okay? And um, it has the biggest amplitude of the other pendulums. I hope, hopefully you can see that. And what about its phase? 90 degrees, right? There's a 90 degree phase lag. Here at this end, we're driving this pendulum below its resonant frequency. And you can clearly see it's got, it's got a small amplitude and it's approximately in phase with the drive. At the other end, we're driving this pendulum um, above its natural frequency. So we're over in this regime here. We get a small amplitude of the response. And do we get a 180 degree phase shift? No, it's not quite 180 degrees, OK? But you can't have everything. We finally just had to, you have to give up on things and move on. But we, we let that go, OK? <laughs> um, all right. Now, I want to point something out here. There's nothing, there's no new physics here. This is just um, a different way of looking at a damped, driven oscillator. Um, here, we're slowly changing the frequency. And here, we see it all in one shot. We see how the oscillator, we, we see how the response occurs when you're on resonance and below resonance and above resonance. And we see it in both amplitude and phase, all in one shot. That's what's nice about this demonstration. Okay, so to conclude, what I'd like to say here is that most students, and probably even me, I can't remember, um, can focus on the amplitude as the most important aspect of resonance. But that's not case. The, the phase is equally as important. I want to explain that now. Um, here's a good example. In the Barton's pendulum apparatus here, we made the length of this pendulum adjustable. You can see this is a threaded rod with nuts here. And we adjusted the length to maximize the response of the middle pendulum. We want that pendulum to resonate, right? So how did we do that? Well, the first, it's just natural. The first thing to do is make the links the same. Well, I got to tell you, what that does, it just gets you in the ballpark. You're just in the ballpark of resonance. You're not sufficiently close to actual resonance. So we said, OK, let's maximize the amplitude. Well, that's a tedious process, because you have to somehow pick up on the amplitude, get some value of the amplitude, change this length a little bit, and see if the amplitude is increasing or decreasing. That's, that's not good. So what did we do? Phase. We adjust this until we see a 90. It takes a little bit of training, but you can eventually pick up on a 90 degree phase difference. That's a sensitive way of finding if you're on resonance. And this has practical implications. There are a lot of times when an oscillator is being driven and you want to drive it on resonance. For example, you could be projecting sound in the ocean with a sonar projector. Um, and you want, to, you want to be on resonance. However, that resonance frequency, the natural frequency, could be changing due to temperature or other effects. And you don't want to have to manually adjust the drive frequency to stay on resonance. So what do you do? Well, <clears throat> you use a feedback control circuit and the, feed, the control circuit needs to pick up on the response of the system. And you're going to and it'll automatically change the frequency to get to the desired response. Well, the natural thing to look at is phase, because the phase is changing quickly here, right? You look for that 90, you demand that it's a 90 degree phase. 
And that's going to give you resonance. Here, this is flat here. But so it's a, it's a precise way of tracking resonance. Thank you for watching.